go, oh yeah, you guys look great. We're all here. <laughs> all right. We are ready. Let's get started. Okay, guys. So um, hello, everybody out there. This is Tony Bancroft of the Bancroft Brothers Animation Podcast with my buddy, and brother and brother Tom Bancroft. How's how you doing, everybody? And we welcome are to the uh, not only the Walt Disney Family Museum uh, viewing of this special Mulan night, but also a podcast. So this is a live podcast that we're recording, also. So if you're watching this uh, because you got tickets, or I don't know how they're doing it at the Walt Disney Family Museum, um, welcome! And you are a part of the podcast just by hanging out and watching us. So we appreciate you being here. For those that don't know, Tom Bancroft and I, Tony Bancroft, are we are twins, twin brothers who also worked at Disney. Believe it or not, yes, we both worked at Disney during the same time. Worked on a lot of the classics of the '90s, from Beauty and the Beast, Lion King all the way through Mulan, which we are gonna be talking about tonight. Um, mm -hmm. So we've been in the animation industry for over 30 years, and this podcast is really a tribute to what we love so very much and what we're passionate about, which is animation. Um, and particularly tonight, we're excited to talk about Disney animation and a remembrance, a time, we're gonna go back a little bit in the time machine and talk about the making of Disney's original Mulan. And yes, we will be talking about um, the live action Mulan 2, which is coming up because for the podcast, this is releasing on September 4th. And that is the day that the live action Mulan releases on Disney Plus. Finally so, comes finally out. Finally came so out. Everybody, Thank you, COVID. please welcome special guests tonight. Barry Cook, the co-director of Mulan and the original Mulan. Thank you. And Matthew Wilder. Wilder, the lyricist for the music of Mulan. Not the lyricist, but the composer Sorry. of the music. Composer. <laughs> That's <laughs> far. Thank you guys up. for coming and being here. At least I didn't call Barry Tony Bancroft, right? Yeah, and to be clear, so um, Matthew Wilder and David Zippel, you guys were a team. Yeah, so David Zippel was our lyricist for Mulan. Um, and uh, it, it was the first uh, Disney feature that you guys had done before, the first project that you had done before, right? Uh, it was first for me, David, I believe, did... Oh, Hercules. Did Hercules come before Mulan? Yeah. yeah. Uh, he had just, he just done Hercules. Yeah. And um, I was the uh, replacement composer for Mulan. Right. Uh, I had sloppy seconds. So <laughs> you, all, you all were together for a period of time before I stepped in, and then it was a whole new day. So the day that I met you guys was the first day for me on the project and my first experience ever dealing with a 25-headed monster. Well, Amazing. we all came on at different times, so I want to shoot it over to Barry now because Barry was my co-director, so I was one of the co-directors on the... I don't think Tom mentioned this, of course, jealousy, <laughs> but I was one of the co-directors on the movie also, partnered up with Barry Cook, and Tony, I came you on... you mention it every podcast. That's right, everybody on the podcast knows, so I don't really... <laughs> Anyway, but Barry came on, I would say, what, a good year before I did. When did you start on the production? And tell us a little bit about how Mulan Barry, got started. Barry is the David Zippel in this case. Right. Well, I don't, know exactly, I don't know exactly the date I came on, but uh, it was pretty early. I guess it was, uh, we're in the middle of production on Aladdin, I think, when, mm -hmm. when I got the job to come on and start developing Mulan and I was the first artist assigned to the movie. Wow. Um, what were you doing on Aladdin, Barry? I was a visual effects animator. Oh. So uh, there's one shot I remember animating that's where Jafar's staff gets smashed on the floor. Mm -hmm. oh. Shot where the staff smashes mm -hmm. and you did the that shot. Smoke. That's the kind of stuff I did. The smash and the smoke. So that's the I kind think, of stuff that I used to do. I think, Barry, you, you and I worked together on the next shot, which was the smoke filling the screen, and then it dissipates. I did Jafar, uh, has now disappeared, and the two guards are, like, hugging each other. And I think those were the last shots I did as an animator before mm -hmm. I sort of went full-time directing. I directed a couple of shorts before that, or maybe the Roger Rabbit short came right after Aladdin, and then mm -hmm. Mulan later. I can't quite remember, but uh, Tom Schumacher, who was the vice president of feature animation said uh let's go have lunch i want to talk to you about something so he took me off to a restaurant where nobody would see us together and uh he said there's two projects that 
we're thinking about developing and one is about a Scottish dragon and one's about a Chinese girl. I said, why don't we put a dragon in the Chinese story? He's like, okay, good idea. Brilliant. <laughs> I guess the, I guess the other, I guess the other movie would have probably been How to Train Your Dragon. I don't know. Oh, well, that was the DreamWorks. Like, that was DreamWorks. It was. It wasn't. It wasn't Disney. It was. <laughs> no, yeah, you just, you just made ago, that <laughs> that that brilliant thing that you just said uh, that actually came, you know, and happened and made that Mulan so great. You you sound like you just sort of made that up as as you went. You're just like, well, hey, it was what true. We did this? It was that. Yeah, it that happened. actually it happened. happened just at lunch. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That was my first response. I said, well, just. I said, let's do the Chinese one, but let's put a dragon because they have dragons too, right? In China. Yeah. So I thought it was a perfect, you know. So what I what I knew about the movie idea. when when I first started on it was that it was based on um, it's actually based on a what two thousand year old uh, Chinese folktale we know that but but the Disney version was based on a children's book by Robert Sansushi Sansushi am I saying yeah, that Sansushi, right Sansushi yeah Robert Sansushi wrote a sm small hmm. children's book and Disney optioned that I guess as the property or, or bought it outright but that was sort of the first bit of material we were handed. Uh, and that she tied lanterns onto a herd of goats to scare the enemy. They thought hundreds of soldiers were coming over the rise and it was lanterns on the horns of a, a flock that's of goats. That's kind of, kind of interesting. Yeah, that's yeah, a neat that's, visual. Yeah. yeah, it's a great visual. Was that in the first, the live in the first version of Mulan before I came? No, that was in, the, that was in a book version. Uh, Just children's in the book, book version. You didn't, yeah. you, didn't, you didn't take it up to the screen? No, we didn't. We didn't no. use it. Okay. But there was a lot of different, I, I, I mean, I remember when I came on, you had just, I, so I came on about eight months to a year after there was a lot of development being done. Um, so it went from you starting off as the single artist. Uh, at some point you got a script writer or two working with you. You started developing drafts of the, the story. Um, there was storyboard artists that came on. There was some visual development artists that came on starting to create the world, right? Because when I came on, I remember there was already a considerable amount of artwork. Chris Sanders, who's a Disney director that did Lilo and Stitch, was our head of story, and he was on it. So tell me a little bit Dean, more about Dean Dubois was already on it. Dean uh, was already on it. Okay. Uh, Chin Yi Chang was on it very early. He was our character designer. Teddy Chris. Newton was off and on it, mm -hmm. but he was on it. Uh, yeah. So we had a little Chris crew Sanders, there on, on Flower right? Street. Chris yeah, Sanders, Chris. Yes. We were there yes. on Flower Street. Uh, yeah. I remember Chris Williams was also a story artist. On Do it. you remember some of the early iterations, some of the crazy ideas that maybe got weaned out of uh, once, once we Jorn started Klubian. going? Jorn Klubian. Jorn Klubian was on it. Early. Oh, Jorn Klubian. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He had a lot to do with yeah, forming the story. Uh, like ideas that didn't make the cut, you mean? Right. I, yeah. Because I, I remember there was an assassination That's attempt. That was good. Early on, I remember talking to you about that there was like an assassination attempt that was based on a live action movie that you really liked. Did, wasn't there, uh, didn't, didn't Mulan try and assassinate the emperor to save him from Shan Yu? Like it was a, a decoy or something or? I don't know, but I mean, there is an assassination attempt in the, in the movie. That is in the movie, Tony. Yeah. No, no, but Mulan, Mulan tries stage to kill. One. Yeah, stage yeah. one where, where Mulan tries to kill oh, the emperor from a distance that, or something. But... Yeah. Like yeah. with a with a bow. And I just arrow. think it's I just think it's really weird looking back that Disney would decide to make a war movie. You know, it's like that's yeah. a strange topic that a character is in the middle of a war for a Disney film and she's not a princess, which I love to say. Yes, true. You, you do say it all the time because they try and put her in the in the in the princess yeah. world for licensing right. and dolls and things. And, I, and we loved that that she wasn't a princess and uh but uh, yeah, and so when it, uh, so Matthew when it when it came to uh, music, so Stephen Schwartz was I think we can officially say that everybody knows that by now. Stephen Schwartz was the first uh, guy doing the music. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess he was doing lyrics and music together. Right. That's um, right. There were some early iteration songs that were done when you were there, Barry. How many how many had Stephen hit upon before uh, probably Matt, before three, he left? Probably three. Probably three songs that I knew of that were, one of them was sort of, sort of sticking, but not really. But 
Um, there was a there was when she cuts her hair. I remember there was a song that he wrote for that moment, right? I think Which, it was about destiny. I think the theme of it was like destiny or something like that. Okay, because mm -hmm. that was a big that was a big story tug that we kept having. Was like, you know, is it her destiny or not her destiny or this and that and the other to be mm -hmm. what she was and. Just sort of uh, this is into... fascinating to me because I, I, I haven't heard some of this backstory. Yeah. yeah. Well, so. and, and for the audience, Matthew, I really want to hear where were you at? Like, how did Disney find you? And how did you uh -huh. get on this track of getting onto Milan? Yeah, had, can, can we can we say up front, Matthew? Because I, I wanted go. to say this part of the intro. We have to mention that for those that don't know, Matthew Wilder is a, a huge, huge pop star and a one-hit wonder having created the song Ain't Nothing Gonna Break My Stride. So if you're, if you're a child of the, was that the early 80s. 90s? 80s. No, that's, 80s. That's 80s, Tony. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Okay. Oh, gosh. You're a child of the 80s and mm -hmm. watch a lot of commercials because it's been used several times since then. Mm -hmm. uh, then you know Ain't Nothing Gonna Break My Stride. Actually, actually, Matthew, I think, I'm sure you know this, that came back pretty hard on TikTok recently. Oh, he knows. It did? <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, I know. <laughs> okay. I know. Yeah, this past January, it blew yeah. up. It's like having yeah. a hit record all over again. Oh, that's um, the new way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Disney um, attended a, a, mu a theater, a music theater fest in Canada, and a, uh, a music score that I had written about an Anne Rice novel called "Cry to Heaven" yes. was one of the one of eight uh, workshops that was being showcased up there. And it was, a, and by my estimation, it was a miserable failure. Everything mm -hmm. that could go wrong went wrong. And I came back to L.A. thinking, well, that's done and dusted. And my phone rings, and it's Disney. Uh, I didn't know that they had scouts up in Canada. Mm -hmm. And they invited me in to have a chat about the idea of signing me to a creative development deal. They said, we know we want to work with you, but we we don't have a project for you right now. And the day, oh. that I, the day that I inked the deal, I mean, this is how I remember it, I was taken to meet Tom Schumacher and that's when he told me, congratulations, you are the new composer uh, for this new project called Mulan. And I'm thinking, what's a Mulan? Right. <laughs> and and, from, and from, that, from that meeting, I was ushered into the conference room where I met all of you for the first time and my eyes were wait out of that was head. your first like that was, first day and you just had, heard about mulan and then you I met had us no no preparation whatsoever oh my gosh. and i walked I in i had no I'm, idea i'm meeting david zippel for the first time what all of you and uh you know the only advice that tom gave me when i on my way out of his office was to have where you're being paid to have an opinion i was like okay so i sat down and we were off to the races he never told the, me that you know? <laughs> yeah. Hey, wait a minute. That wasn't the same deal for us. <laughs> they didn't want to hear from you and Barry. Barry and, and, and the, I remember the first meeting that we had, we were there to, to spot, um, to have an opinion about which moments I'm pointing up, like I'm looking at the storyboards, storyboards that were yeah. up on the board, up on the wall. And, and uh, we were spotting the moments and choosing which, pla which places we wanted to musicalize. And the first slot that we chose was Mulan's reflection. Wow. Well, I will say, no, wait, back up real quick. Go ahead. My assumption is by your description there, it, we, you went from pop star uh, to, to doing some, what? Uh, was like that Broadway music? show yeah, stuff. Broadway type stuff to Ooh, now being well. in a room. Uh, my assumption is you've never done an animated that was my home before, right? That was my first experience. So you'd never seen a beat board. Did you even know what you were kind of looking for and how to kind of go about that? But it, I guess no, it's wouldn't. called flying by the seat of your pants. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Barry and I were doing too. We were all doing that. Too. Yeah, I, I had, doing. you know. So I was just everything was reactive. Uh, what do you need from me? Okay, you want me to choose a moment, uh, David Zippel or David Zippel sitting over here actually, and. Um, we just came to a, a, a very easy consensus, and I thought this is this is going to be great. You know, it's going to be a lot of fun. Piece of cake. But, yeah, but you know, and then then we got into the actual writing of the moment, and that's when the learning curve <laughs> became much greater. <laughs> exactly. Right. Now, uh, and how how, how was it different for you? Sorry, I'm sorry, Tony. Go ahead. Well, how was it different for you from say writing a pop song? 
to, to writing a, a song that had to be a tent post in a story. Right. Um, uh, it's different, you know, but the, the, just from the standpoint of if you're going to use Break My Stride as an example where you're pulling something out of thin air and I can say whatever pops into my head lyrically mm-hmm. and musically, uh, you know, music is music. So, but lyrically, it's a, it's a different headspace. Whereas, you know, you have the luxury of characters that you have to support that have a voice and you have to tell, keep the story moving. And I was sort of learning uh, as I go on, you know, I, I guess I, uh, I'm trying to find the right phrase that is not rude. Um, they have a New York phrase that uh, <laughs> I'm trying to avoid. You probably should not say, yeah, <laughs> right. No, yeah. considering, yeah. but we'll edit, it we'll, we'll edit this out later. But anyway, the idea is that it's, it's your, uh, your first try, uh, it, the first time um, was with Cry to Heaven and trying to tell story through lyric and song. So mm-hmm. I, had, I had had a, uh, a shot at that, and I guess that's when Disney saw that I, was, uh, I had the ability to be able to do that. Yeah. And um, so I was like, okay, let's, let's go. Did now, I answer the question? You, I don't know. I, yes. We're yes, just you did. say yes, you did. Um, <laughs> we, now, when you're writing that, uh, when you're uh, composing the music and writing that music, uh, now you've been a lyricist in the past, obviously, with yeah. – songs and things like that so Mm -hmm. was it hard for you not to kind of offer you know lyrics suggestions or Um, or was that accepted were you okay to do that David and I found a a tempo between the two of us that was very um, fluid and uh, it was uh, a very generous environment to be in and I had (laughs) the, 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 the song that we were discussing before we went on air Keep him, uh, not keep him guessing, but the other tune that we wrote for uh, Eddie Murphy's character, the um, Mushu, uh, David went kicking and screaming on that one because it was just something that was completely far afield of what he was used to doing theatrically. So there was this ebb and a flow between us where I'd help him, he'd help me. Well, that's kind of how um, Barry and I worked together too. I, I was a first time director too. So just like there was a new experience for you, Matthew, this was my first time directing uh, really anything for feature uh, for feature or for Disney in general. Wow. Whereas Barry had done a couple, couple shorts, shorts. At that, uh-huh. couple shorts at that point and Barry had started on the film. So I would imagine Barry was, and we've talked about it since then, was not very keen on having a new partner coming in when I did. Um, but we found our rhythm too. And I'm yeah. happy to say that it did take some time. I think any creative team really does take time. Well, it's to... like the partnership. It's like the same with uh, Matthew and David and the same with myself and Tony. We didn't choose each other. Yeah, right. Not even, so, not even over Tinder. It's, not a, even blind, over, it's a blind date. It was a total blind, it was a I total blind marriage. I left. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. It was a total blind marriage. It's just like, yeah. you two guys are in this together. Go. And it's like, what? That's right. You know, it was very strange. Make uh, it work. But, but, you know, like uh, partnerships at Disney, like Ron and John, uh, John Musker and Ron Clements, they were sort of creative partners even in college. You know what uh-huh. I mean? They worked on projects together. And they just came out as partners, kept, kept working as creative partners, telling stories together. And they just continue even to this day to make films together so i'm, cu- I'm curious started. barry were you the only director on the on the original version of mulan at that point did you not have a, a partner in directing at, at uh, no not really i mean chris sanders was there as a you know potential head of story although i don't think he had been named that yet but you know i had plenty of strong story support with chris and and others you know there but uh yeah Oh, yeah, he but was yeah, a single director. But knowing, knowing there would be multiple, you know, at least two directors, because that's sort of the way Disney had fashioned their machine at the time, and that's the way it worked. And, you know, for obvious reasons, in case one of us got hit by a bus, you know, one, one guy's down with the flu for a week, yeah. the right. show goes on, you know. That's, so that's the obvious reasons. And then the really creative and smart reasons are, you know, it's just iron sharpening iron and, and finding ways to – get through problems and commiserating. Yeah. And back then Disney had a philosophy um, of putting how they put people together were trying to find, especially if they weren't already joined at the hip, two directors like Ron and John, 
was they tried to find directors that had different backgrounds that that could really kind of bring something different to the to the show. So I came more from character animation, even though mm -hmm. I was still very young in character animation. I will point out I had only done a couple features and just finished Lion King and created the character Pumbaa, the warthog for the Lion King. And um, so I came from character background. And then Barry, of course, came from visual effects background. Well, and I want to jump in there and say that this, uh, Barry, you were the very, I think, the first and only, and there's only two that I know of, uh, effects animators who became directors at Disney, right? Mark Dindo. Uh, Mark Dindo. Would be the other Mark one. Mark Dindo was the other one. Uh, but I think Randy being, Fulmer, you know, Randy Fulmer, the producer of Emperor's New, Emperor's New Groove, yeah. Uh, he, was, uh, he, was he was in the effects department. Oh, he came from right. the effects department. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it was sort of unusual, but I will say as an effects animator, just like in visual effects and live action films, what our passion was, what my passion was, was filmmaking, period. Mm -hmm. Shot by shot, telling stories visually, where the camera should be, composition, camera, visuals, that sort of was just, you know, from a child beat into my head, you know, from my dad being a painter. but. Uh, but so I had a, just this broad interest in telling stories on film. And uh, so that's sort of my filmmaker part that I felt like I was real passionate about that I brought, not so much animation necessarily, I wasn't mm -hmm. a character animator, but uh, just sort but, of. Oh, so that what's interesting about that is that both of you, and, and this is true of a lot of the Disney films is when they would get two directors together, at least one of them was a story artist almost every time, right? I'd say and neither one of us were 80, yeah. 90 percent of the time it is. And neither of you guys were. Did that make you guys really lean on Chris Sanders quite a bit? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's one of the reasons that Chris is the very first. And this is something that I think we're very proud of was one of the very first storyboard artists to ever get a screenwriter's credit. He got a screenwriter's credit um, on Mulan. On Mulan. Yeah. Uh, because he contributed so now he never wrote a script. He never sat at the type board, you know, or typewriter and typed anything up. But um, his storyboards and his vision for the story was so influential that he contributed uh, as much, if not more, than any but Chris, other. But Chris, the of the film. Chris told me, he can correct me, but Chris told me one time um, that he did a lot of writing, not necessarily at work. He said whenever he came across a story problem, one way he would always solve it is just go write it, maybe longhand in a notebook. He would just try to write out the story situation. And so he, he sort of relied on writing sort of in the, in the back room of, of how he did his magic. But. Well, and again, a lot of people don't know this, but, and I would say, especially in the case of Chris, probably on Mulan, but a lot of the, the storyboard artists, a lot of times when they're like given, especially very early in the film, when the, maybe the script isn't quite working or whatever, you guys, directors, are going, here, take this and kind of make it work. This is what we're looking for. And that oftentimes will mean, in the case of Chris especially, them writing dialogue. Absolutely. Right? Half, the, di so, half the dialogue written in Mulan was written by a story artist. More yeah, than half of it. For wow. sure. Probably 70% of it. Well, and, and back then, uh, this is how they also did it with the two directors, is that based on our skill sets, we would separate out all the different departments because like Barry was saying earlier, it's such a Herculean job to do an animated feature over the duration of four years. And in our case, two different coasts and hundreds of artists and staff. Yeah, a crew of about so, 600 people, more than 600 people. Yeah, so we split up everything, all the departments, and there were certain departments that we did together, that we would always join together and talk together so that our heads were in the same space. Story was one, of course, editorial was another one. Any kind of recordings we did with the actors, we did those together. Um, you know, score composing at the end, post-production at the end. But then any of the creative art, artistic departments, we separated out. So I was in charge of character animation at first and then Barry joined me later too. And uh, ironically, effects. And Wait, no, effects department. You, no, you Did were in charge effect? of effects. You you don't don't, oh, CG, CG. Oh, CG, yeah. CG, computer animation. I, did, I was in charge of that department, cleanup. So those were all kind of based in the, in the world of character animation, I guess you could say. And then Barry was in charge of effects, of course, layout and background painting because he had a but, a, a but I would say this background. a lot of the computer animation that was done for Mulan because again this is a lot earlier in the CG world right this is when CG was still pretty new in the Disney realm 
uh, a lot of it was effects kind of stuff. It was stuff that yeah. usually in the past would have been done by the effects. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you describe one of the moments uh, in the film uh, that would have, I know the, the, uh, the um, landslide was, was a big effects moment, right? Yeah, yeah, that was a big yeah. effects moment. Yeah, but the horses effect. coming over the hill, those were CG horses and riders. Right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But the, all the avalanche was hand-drawn stuff. But even smaller stuff, like I remember, again, during the avalanche, um, and remember Mushu's riding on a shield, uh -huh. uh, and he grabs uh, uh, <laughs> a hun out of the uh -huh. snow. Uh -huh. and goes, yeah. Nope. Yeah, and then he grabs Cricky. Um, yeah. but, but I did the animation of uh, Mushu on that and the hun guy. But uh, but Rob uh, Bukuras, uh did um, did the shield, and so the, the shield. shield was actually done first in CG animation, oh. and, and and describing the arc of the slide, and then I could then put Musho on top of that. Yeah, that's David, some of the magic David Tidgewell was our Dave Tidgewell was our head of effects. Mm -hmm. They did a great job. Yeah, we, we had a great crew, and and I guess it's worth mentioning up front here too that um, this film started at the Burbank. Uh, studio in Burbank, California, the main studio for feature animation. That's largely where we met with uh, Matthew and David and all the executives were there. But it was being prepared for through story and everything like that, being prepared to be animated on through the end at the new, uh, at the Disney MGM Studios in Orlando, Florida, the Florida Animation Studio. And uh, it was their first feature. They had done shorts before that, including a couple of Barry Cook shorts that he directed. Well, we'd done features, but only parts of Parts of, yeah. Right. So this was our first full feature uh, created out of the Florida studio. Tom, so, were you based in Florida at that time? I was, yeah. So Tony and I first came over when they first opened, you know, mm -hmm. and we joined Barry. Barry, uh, all three of us uh, were there opening day, uh, May 1st of 1989. Yeah. Sure. And uh, Tony left after about a year and went crying back to California. Wee. Why, why did I go crying back to California? It's too hot. It's yeah, too it hot. Was, oh, it's so complaints. sweaty here. I, know. I had a girl. I had, there was a girl involved. It was love. It was a love story. That's why I went yeah. back to California. Right. Right. He got engaged. I, I got. Oh, had to get okay. married. But but meanwhile, I had gotten That's married. Understand. And and my wife liked it in Florida, so I stayed. And so that was kind of when we separated. Tony and I. But, uh, but yeah, so I had been uh, working there for years, uh, you know, on all the other Disney films, uh, waiting for Mulan to start. Mm. Okay. That's like yeah. waiting for Guffman, but with Mulan. It's just like that. <laughs> just like that. So uh, back to music, because I, 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 you got a keyboard in front of you. So I, Matthew, I, think music. It's, I think it's worth asking you a little bit about your process when working with David early on. So we mentioned that the songs become tent posts and we talk about them really early. Like, oh, we got to have like, you know, a hero song or maybe is there going to be a villain song? And we talk about it as a structural element in the beginning. But then we, when you really get down to brass tacks, we start really nailing in like, well, what is the song about? Where does it right. go? Does it have a beginning, middle and an end to it? Structure itself. What's your thoughts on one of the most impactful songs from the, from the film? Um, uh, early on was Mulan's reflection song. Right. And was that the first one? I'm trying to remember. Was that the first one that you guys did? That's that's my recollection. It was yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, actually, it is, and I'll tell you why. Because uh, we went through uh, what we thought was going to be the f the first and final draft of the of the song, Au Contraire, <laughs> but. Um, uh, I had written a different chorus than what everybody came to know as the final version of, of Reflection. Oh. But we had everybody in the room, and, and you guys can attest to this, there's, what, 20 people in, in, in a staff meeting for yeah. the film? Usually. Way too many. Way too many, yes. A lot of, a lot of opinions, and we yeah. really put, we put this through the grinder. Uh, so uh, David and I came in with what we thought was going to be the, the final version, and Chris Montan the executive music producers in on this meeting as well. And we all looked at one another and said, yep, this is the one. This is the version we're going to show Mikey. So we went down Michael to- Michael Eisner, who was Michael then Eisner. the CEO of the whole company. That's right. And we went down into the theater in the animation building uh, to show Michael the, the rough draft, uh, which was a demo of the song with a female singing it. And the story, you know, the film storyboard of Mulan's reflection. 
-hmm. and this was the first time I was meeting Michael Eisner. Hadn't met uh, him before. Yeah. Okay. So we all file into the into the theater, and as I, I have to underscore this, we were all of the same mind that this was the version that we needed to show Michael. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then so <laughs> the, see where the this is going. The yeah. lights go down. The curtain goes up. They play the song and the and the scene, and then Michael asks to hear the song again. Uh, and he listens and he's listening with his eyes closed. And then uh, at the end of the uh, second playback, he gets up from his seat and he moves across the aisle in the theater and sits on the back of the chair across from me. He had 20 some odd people to choose from, but sits across from me and leans in. He says, you and I have never met before. And I thought, uh oh, uh -oh. <laughs> he says, so this is going to be a hard conversation. And then he proceeds to tell me, he says, I'm not a musician and I, I, I can't talk musical terms to you. I can only describe to you how I was feeling as I was listening to the song. And very briefly, he says, uh, when the song first started, I thought this is going to be something very, very special. And then it got to the chorus and then he stopped himself and he says, listen, this is the first song that you've written for this score and you need to break the glass ceiling. I mean, I remember this is like, like it was yesterday. Talk about pressure, right? And, yeah. and I'm just, my eyes were probably as big as saucers, and I'm leaning <laughs> back. And he said, um, and so when it got to the chorus, it didn't really break the glass ceiling for me. And that's all I, ha I can tell you. It's, you, know, you have to figure out how to solve that issue. So that yeah. afternoon, I went back to my little studio, my little house in the prairie, and I just gritted my teeth and had at it. And by the next morning, I had the new chorus, the new music written, the music that everybody came to know as Reflection. Now, and that's a great story. Wow. That is hard. Like, how do you know what that even means, right? That's such a, uh, uh, you know, uh, non-words as far as description of what you needed to do. Yeah. Did you I don't like know. You it's a it? mystery. <laughs> it's, like, it's like right out of... Shakespeare in love, you know, you just, uh, I knew that what he was sort of trying to tell me was that he wanted something bigger and, you know, more sweeping like grander. and grander. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I went into the mechanics of the tune and deconstructed and reconstructed. So it was, um, can you play a little bit of Long's reflection? Yeah. Um, That brings back so many memories, doesn't it, Barry? I mean, I remember hearing that version for the first time. It was just you on the keyboards and you singing the song. It was so personal and so so, so small, so small and personal. Well, and, the first chorus was was a lot more internal as well. Yeah, you know, so uh, I can see where you would think it was small, and that was part of the problem. <laughs> they wanted it bigger, so we went bigger. And, and it became that. I mean, some of that was orchestration, though, too, wasn't it? Oh, sure. Yeah, it's everything. Because the melody that, uh, for, for reflection is near impossible for anybody to sing. It, it lives in two different keys. And you needed a very special vocalist to, to sing it. So it's a, it's a recipe for everything. You know, it's, the, it's how the construction of the song works. But when you put everything else on top of it, the orchestration... The vocalist Lea Salonga, mm. and then later Christine Aguilera. Yeah, They're, these yeah. are incredible singers, and it was a very difficult melody to sing. That's why I'm not singing right now. <laughs> <laughs> Tony almost did. I, 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 I would have. Yeah, I would have. But to Tom's break out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Barry, what was your first impression when you heard that song? Remember that first moment when we were together and we heard that? Well, it was very special for me personally because. On the research trip we had made to China, we found these big bays. There's one place that had all these big bays. And, and I was like, what are these things? And uh, they explained to us, our tour guide, where these aren't tombs, but they memorialize uh, important people in the community, or sometimes they're a family bay. And there was this 
big courtyard we were in, it was a public space. But we began to notice that like, they all had different surfaces and different reflective properties in them, you know, as far as, and, and originally when we were talking to Chris Sanders about the moment, it was like, maybe she should look different in every reflection. In other words, maybe a little stretched out, a little mm. skinnier, like a, like a house of mirrors sort of thing. Yeah. We, we didn't yeah. do that. We didn't do that. But, uh, but one thing that Chris did, which was absolute genius at the end of the song, she turns away from the bays and her black hair erases all of the faces, the multiple yeah. faces, except for one. And that was just, talk about cinematic moments in animated films. That was one cinematic moment that you, you know, when you find moments like that visually, coupled with music that's perfect fit, it's, you know, it's- Can I also add one other- Magic one other, is. Other wrinkle is that reflection almost got cut from the film. Yes, yes, you, you remember that? You remember that? Yes. So we had a screening, we're, yep, I'll set it up and then you tell the story. But we had an early screening of the, of the entire film and um, and those early screens are always brutal. They're they're always difficult. They're always really awkward. Nothing ever seems to work very well. But you know you got to have it. You got to go through that first screening and see what's working and what's not. And we thought you know Mulan reflect Mulan's reflection since it was it was conceived so early on. People had applauded it individually, but when it was cut into the film, it did have. It, it overstayed its welcome. Remember, that was kind of the thing that Tom Schumacher would say over and over. Guys, I just feel like it just overstayed its welcome. That was his saying. It, was it shortened that, at some point? It was shortened, yeah. But is that your recollection, Matthew? Well, yeah, I think it was motored by uh, another thing that had been explained to me was uh, one of the uh, predecessors, one of the earlier uh, films that had preceded Mulan was not testing very well when the audiences when the when the ballad moment came the audience perceived that as a popcorn moment so it's when they get up and they saw oh, the ballad and they go out into the lobby and that was a bathroom the, moment usually a bathroom exactly <laughs> well i was being a little bit more polite yeah with the thank popcorn you analogy you. but um <laughs> that's how it had been explained to me by pam coates our producer yeah and saying that you know uh don't be upset but uh reflection is hanging by a thread they're talking about cutting it from the film and that to me that was sacrilege and and i said well maybe it was the ballad itself that wasn't good did anybody stop to think about that maybe that's what was holding back the moment not in that film not in ours so the mm -hmm. compromise was to cut the song in half and they lost a verse and a chorus if i remember of, right that's right but um and much to my surprise it feels incredibly satisfying you're not left wanting uh you get the gist of what mulan's reflection you know her 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 moment is really all about it it feels fully realized yeah um i was but david and i were devastated when they came to us and told us we might have to cut it from the movie and we just said that's crazy we yeah. fought tooth and nail for it yeah, and, and, and Barry and yeah. I, have, having never done a musical before, I think we felt the same way. We felt like, what? This is, we love this song. This, is, this doesn't make sense. So when it was suggested, and I don't know where the suggestion of just, well, maybe we just like cut a verse and a chorus out. We just shorten it because it's overstaying its welcome, as Tom would say. That seemed to be the resolve. That seemed to be the, the nice resolve. But with that, we actually, we had, that was our first sequence that we put into production. So we had been doing layouts on that in Florida. We had the animators working on it and we lost a bunch of animation too. That was, mm -hmm. that was out the door. Wow. And that wasn't, that wasn't the only time. There was yeah. actually other cuts that would come later uh, where we lost significant amount, amount of animation. And, and inter remember... interestingly enough, uh, reflection is driving a good portion of, of the emotional arc in the new film. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. And we are oh. going to talk about the new film in just a little bit here. You're yeah. saying the music, right? Yes. The, the, the music. lyrics aren't involved I, no. from what I understand. Okay. No, that's true. 
Um, By the way, to, to all of our listeners, um, uh, as usual, I'm odd man out when it comes to uh, the newest Milan, the live action film. I have not seen it, but the rest oh. of you guys have. Oh. Maybe yeah. some spoilers uh, here, Tom. Well, you, might okay. cover your, you might want to take off your headphones. In fairness to you guys, actually, this is good for me because I'm not going to make a spoiler because of that. You guys could and ruin it for a lot of people. So big we'll warning be careful. there. We're not doing spoilers for the new no. film. Well, well um, uh, let's go back to the original first, but I will just as a teaser, just say that, yes, um, the three of us, Barry, myself, Matthew, were invited to, uh, which ended up being the very last um, big premiere in Hollywood right before COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, they were still planning on releasing it two weeks after the premiere that we saw. And, um, and almost two days, three days after we saw that premiere, uh, uh, everything, everything shut, shut down. down. Yeah. So um, it was amazing to be a part of that without masks and everything. There was, there was people already starting to freak in out. That was definitely part of the conversation though. Yeah. Pam Coates wouldn't hug me. Oh really? Uh, Although Ming Na, Ming Na Wen did and Chris Sanders did. That's a good hug. That's a good hug to have from both yeah. of those. Yeah. yeah. Uh, several like people at the, uh, at the premiere was told they can't, they succumb to the COVID. Really? Yeah. Really? They, they, there was an article that came out. This is a, a little, another aside. There was an article that came out in uh, Daily Variety or something that pointed towards that premiere, Mulan premiere, as the start of COVID through Hollywood. There it you was, go. That, that there was quite a few people <laughs> that got sick. Fault. We're famous. They <laughs> traced it back to that premiere. This is the first time that anybody's oh, hearing about it probably. But uh, <laughs> it's true because there was a bunch of Chinese people that came in for that, just That's for right. that. And mm -hmm. I remember thinking... How did, did these people arrive weeks or months ago? How could they have, we had shut this down morning. the airports. You know, I mean, there was, a, China was like, you know, it was, they shut the airports down to anybody coming in from China. So I could not figure and out. By the way, more trivia, Wuhan, right, is <laughs> where they say that some reports are, where COVID started, right, is, is where the original Mulan is supposedly to have started. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was funny when we were over there, we visited a lot of places in China and we covered a lot of territory, but every little village we went to, they said, Oh yeah, she was from here. <laughs> Everyone claimed it. Yeah. She was from here. She was from our village. Yeah. Yeah. That was our, that was like, she was like the nation's knows? daughter though. That's I funny. mean, everybody wanted to claim Mulan because uh, she was such a beloved character in the history of China. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of the mantle that we had on our shoulders going into this was, and I think it's worth saying in today's pers from today's perspective, when you look at these four white guys that made Mulan, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's worth saying that we made Mulan in a different time um, and a different era, obviously, where um, I feel incredibly, and I'm sure you guys all do, incredibly um, lucky and fortunate that we had the opportunity that we did because um, I would I would generally think that that would not be our opportunity now and I, and probably for very good reason. So, um, we, you know, it was, it was a mantle on our shoulders that we wanted to make a, a strong female heroine. Um, both Barry and I have daughters and um, I had already had one or two. Yes. One was born on Mulan um, by that point. And so it was in, you know, it was incredibly important for us to make a strong female heroine that would represent females, um, from our generation on. And I think we did that. And I'm, that's one of the things I'm probably most proud of um, when it comes to Mulan standing I, you know, and today. I, I just want to do a shout out too to the Florida studio because we're talking about a lot of firsts, right? All of yeah. you guys, this was the first time you've been directors and, and worked on a Disney film from Matthew. And, and the Florida studio, this was their big chance too. They were yeah. always mm -hmm. number two, right? Mm -hmm. We always felt that way. Yeah. Um, we were the smaller one, the, the newer studio, of course, not the main studio. And now here we were be, being given our first feature film. It could have been uh, the little mud boy and we would have made that thing the best mud boy <laughs> film you'd ever seen. That I'm sounds like you. a good movie. Yeah, actually, I think it is. Yeah, I'm working on <laughs> our it. next project. Um, <laughs> but but I'm, but that I just want to do that shout out to say that so many and including myself, so many of the animators were first time supervising animators. So many of the cleanup people were the first time key mm -hmm. cleanup people. Almost every department, our art director, um, you know, uh, Rick, right? It was his first feature mm -hmm. film, at least, to be a, uh, the art director. Uh, had a background, same thing. 
all the way down, really. Um, almost every single department head was, it was their first time. And so, yeah. you know, that old adage, when you're number two, you try harder. Um, yeah. Um, We're also too, when you're happening. sort of young and dumb, you don't think anything's impossible. And there was such a, that's, that studio is just such a, a, a enigma, really. It's like, I've never been, I never worked in an environment like that before or since. Uh, it was just a little Shangri-La. It was amazing sort of thing. Everybody just pulled their weight in an amazing way. And we just loved what we were doing every second of the day. We just, mm. you know, yeah, what a blessing that is. It was fantastic. It really was. We talked yeah. about this, Barry. I don't know if you've heard it, but we did a podcast just a couple podcasts back. I've heard was, about it. I've had friends call me about it. Yes, you need to listen to it. And it was a Florida, you know, reminiscing about the Florida studio that yeah. we did, Tony and I, and then Jim Jackson and Aaron Blaze. And uh, it was a small perspective because it was only the four of us, obviously. You, you, yeah. We could literally do a podcast every week with a new person from the Florida studio and just get new stories and new perspectives. Yeah. And they would all be heartwarming and so emotional. I heard the 10th old man made an appearance. Yeah, we talked about you quite a bit. About <laughs> yeah, we that. did. Yeah, we did. Some of us good too. Anyway, back to Matthew. I, I wanted to ask you, Matthew, about, um, I, well, let me start with a story. So a couple of years ago, I went to, uh, I was asked to be a guest speaker at a convention in Mexico City. And um, never been there before, but it's a, they have a really cool big uh, animation festival they put on there. And they wanted to screen Mulan. It was, I don't know which anniversary it was at the time. Um, and they wanted me to be there to speak about it. Um, and when we watched, so I spoke about it. And then when we watched it together as an audience, and it was a full theater, big, big group of people that were watching it, all young people. Um, they, it became kind of a sing-along as you would expect wow. these, 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 uh, these kids, I'm going to call <laughs> them kids cause I'm showing my age. They grew up with these songs. And when I'll make a man out of you came up. They sang that. We actually turned the film down because I loved hearing their voices so much, but they sang <laughs> it in Spanish. I don't know if you've heard another no, country haven't. sing one of your songs, mm -hmm. uh, but to hear so cool. it in Spanish and they, they knew the, 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 inflections. the, place, the inflections. Thank you. The inflections of the original Spanish voices like like we would know Leia Salonga singing Reflection Song or something like that. They knew it so well that they even had all the beats and the moments and the pauses down and they did it together in perfect harmony. I recorded <laughs> it. I was so, it made me cry. I was just like so wow. taken by that moment. Have you had, since Mulan has come out, have you had some experiences like that? Because this, these songs are beloved by everybody. Um, not probably not to that degree, but, uh, yeah. and I'm not trying to push the train faster than it's meant to go in this, in this podcast, but, uh, in my work on the new film, mm -hmm. uh, where, uh, we were called in, in the 11th hour, the film had already been in production for quite some time. And I guess they probably had about 80% of it in the can. Yeah. And there was apparently quite a pushback from, the audience and the test uh, um, screenings. Oh, saying, fans were upset. Yeah. Where's fans, the music? Yeah. Where's the music? So yeah. they, they called us up, David and myself and said, can you come in and, and let's explore and see what we can, we can drum up. And so we revisited, uh, I'll make a man out of you and reflection were the two moments and a little bit of honor to us all. And uh, the point that I'm trying to make is, is that when, we finally got through our process and they said, nah, the songs aren't working. But when they, uh, when the film composer, uh, Harry Gregson Williams was, uh, imposed upon to take the music from the original score and utilize those themes, mm -hmm. uh, in the, in his score, uh, they used reflection in such a, a way that that was the moment where it really came full circle for me because mm -hmm. it, it, it the theme kept coming back and back and back. And I, I don't want to get into a spoiler alert here, but <laughs> yeah. by the time, by the time uh, it came back for the third or fourth time, I can't remember. I wasn't really counting. It just, it, it sent a, sh a lightning up, up my spine. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was something that, um, and I really, I was just going along for the ride. So I, it's somewhat similar to what you're describing when you're, 
it's being played back to you in such a capacity that, that you can't help but yeah. feel um, that connection, that, that visceral connection to something that just sparks an emotional reaction that you can't describe. And, and we had nothing to do with the live action film. At least I know I didn't. Yeah, Except I didn't Except when sitting watching it, you know you had a lot to do with it because you just feel like, wow, you know, that little thing we did, at least it's what it felt like, that quaint little movie we made. And uh, you see people reinterpreting these story ideas and adding to them and exploring different moments. And Nikki Caro's take on it as a director. And, you know, I loved her movie, Well Rider, and she's like the perfect person to make that movie. Mm. Um, but you feel like you do have a part of it and it is a part of you. On the, it's like, you feel like, wow, you feel like a proud parent sort of, or a proud mm -hmm. grandparent maybe sitting there saying, wow, I remember when we talked about that similar moment in the animated film, creating it with the guys and, mm -hmm. and, and figuring it out. And, and now here it is realized in a whole different sort of medium and a whole different way of telling the story. It was, you know, sort of, it's exciting. Just I also, I also saw it. a high school production of Mulan. A I saw oh, one yeah. in Australia, a high school. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, again, you know, you see how it gets paid forward. You know, you, yeah. do, you do see your work just taking on its own, its own how did life. They, how did they yeah. do the hunt attack coming over the hill? How did that go? <laughs> it never looks good. I'm sure it, <laughs> stick like animals being thrown out. Yeah, yeah. Throwing <laughs> dolls over the... Okay. But, but I want to, I want to just wait, circle back jump. to, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Tom. Oh, you mean in the I high school off. production? Yeah. In the high school. Yeah. Yeah. But Barry, I want to, I want to stay on that thread for just a second and just say, you know, uh, without spoilers, of course, were there moments when you're watching the movie and you're like, wait a second, did they grab that from something that we cut out? You know, things that we, you, like you said, you discussed. And I know this is a very different take on Mulan, but does it still feel like this is the sub question to that too? Does it still feel like your Mulan or is she really different to where you almost don't recognize her? As a character, I think uh, the heart and soul of the character is definitely there. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think so. I think so. I think, uh, yeah, she's makes maybe some different decisions than the original Mulan may, would have made or whatever, but still, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I sort of like, there she is in the flesh. It was sort of astounding to me, you know, like this character you had invented before this actress was maybe even born, right? Or close to it. Probably. Yeah. Right? I don't know, but you know, she was maybe a baby when we were doing this movie. Yeah. And now she's playing this part that we helped create, you know, so it's, I don't know, I just feel very proud of the legacy of it and having mm -hmm. part of it, you know. I, I think, um... It, uh, we might as well get to it and talk a, bit, a little bit more about the live action movie uh, because where we sit right now, this will be releasing as a podcast on September 4th and it'll be uh, the live action movie is going to be a special pay-per-view kind of event through Disney plus. Mm -hmm. And I know for myself, uh, it's my daughter's birthday that day. We're oh. going to watch it as a family. So probably right now I can oh, say happy birthday. Too. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, Caitlin. Uh, happy birthday, Caitlin. <laughs> and um, because we're going to watch it. Yeah. But, having seen it already at that earlier premiere that we were talking about, I remember sitting, Barry and I sat next to each other. And then Pam Coates, our producer was behind us. Ming-Na, Ming-Na Wen was behind us. Uh, and I don't want to give a spoiler alert, but um, she had a significant role to play in the, in the making of the, the new live action one too. Mm. And, um, but I remember when the, the lights came up and there, you know, they're scrolling all of the credits and it was our first chance to kind of look at each other. And I remember looking at you, Barry, and it was like, wow, you know, uh, Nikki, Nikki Carl really did it. They did it. Um, because there was that, you know, that all the fans are feeling right now as they're anticipating, they want to see this new Milan. They're excited because they love the original. We really appreciate that as the people that crafted that first film, but there's that, did she get it right? Did she really give, did she bring honor to us all? You know, I think that's the thing. It's <laughs> corny, I know. But mm -hmm. is, that's the thing that I think that we were thinking. Yeah. And, um, and she really did. I got, my hats are, my hat is off big time to Nikki Caro. And I got to say the casting of, I hope I'm going to say her name right. Yu Yi Fei, Yu Yi Fei, 
the actress, the Chinese actress that played Mulan. She was so good. Mm -hmm. I felt like she was an extension of our Mulan, like she had started there, but took it so much further. I felt mm -hmm. like she was Mulan and yet so much more. And yeah. it was a very surreal kind of feeling for me because there was so much originality that she brought and yet was still very based in um, the performance and the girl that Ming-Na Wen did the voice for in our film. Um, and it brought back, and Tom, you alluded to this too, the film brought back so many visual moments that we didn't actually get in the movie. So I, there, I found myself going, how did they see all those early Hans Bacher production design paintings? That they may didn't, have. That they didn't end have. up, and they may have, they may have, yeah. but there was well, definitely the, the like wide shots. for a long time, Tony. Yeah, yeah, that's no, true. No, there no. is the art of Mulan that, she could, the, that Nikki the could have looked at. But yeah. there was moments where I like, God, we wanted to get that in our movie and it never quite got there. And yet she's got it in her movie. There was almost like a little jealousy, but then there was also a really like deep reminiscent time for me where I'm thinking about, I'm seeing scenes where there's pots and there's, you know, um, obviously costumes and things like that where I'm like, we had discussions about all that. I mean, that was like a week long discussion talking about the apparel, the dress, you know, the costuming and our designs of them and, and this village and what would have been accurate to that time period and the research that we put into it. Cause that's one thing that I will say for art directors, our production designer, for all of our designers and, and the talented crew in the Florida studio, they dug deep. We really cared about, what the Chinese, how the Chinese culture would come a lot, uh, come across, how, how historically our film would stack up in, um, for the Chinese, you know, with not no just internet for us. To speak of. I, yeah. I and really we did it all with, I know that's amazing, <laughs> isn't Google it? Google searches. Yeah. No Google, no, no internet. We barely had a library. Books. We had to find so many books that were, that were only in China. I remember that was part of your trip, right? I, don't, I wasn't on that original yeah. trip. But well, you guys were buying up books to, and taking them home. I didn't go to China. For my research for Mulan, get, get this, for Mushu, I went to Epcot and went to the Chinese pavilion. That's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> I dug deep. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's deep. Got it right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Barry, I have to ask you. So, I, I'm, I'm, again, I haven't seen the movie yet. I'm like everybody else on the internet that just cried out in, in anger and frustration to find out Mushu was not in this movie. Mm. So because you were the supervising animator too. Well, That's of right. Course, he's that, your baby. Can, it's, it's personal. Yeah. Uh, this time it's personal. Maybe he's going to get his own movie. <gasps> oh, oh, maybe with a phoenix. No. So tell me, <laughs> what uh, what was your reaction? And, and you don't have to talk to me about like the movie necessarily, but your reaction of hearing that Mushu wasn't going to be in this originally. Because well, it's funny because um, if anybody knows me, they know that I'm not much of an animation fan. <laughs> I, I yeah. make it, but I don't eat it. Sort of. I mean, I uh -huh. I love movies, but animation's the last thing on my list when it comes to seeing movies the very very last thing on my list um but uh so i knew it would i knew it wouldn't have the maybe cartoon aspects that we had you know sidekick characters or cricket or you know it's got maybe little hints of maybe nods to some of those things but um but to me that's you know i'm not a fan who's saying i want my song i want my character i'm so i'm not I don't have any, you know, any horse to beat in that regard. I don't, it's just like, we made our version and Nikki and company made their version and somebody else 15 years from now will probably make their version and another version or a sequel and probably it'll be a franchise, you know, if it's as, if it's, you know, as successful as I assume and think it's going to be. Well, I think movie, 15 so. years from now we'll see the live action of Mulan too. Right. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Maybe. Yep. Oh, I hope I'm there to see it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me too. Um, well, Matthew, and, I, and I'm kind of digressing a little bit to the original, but um, how was it working within the, you know, you being the composer for these, the songs, but then you have uh, Gary Goldsmith. Uh, sorry. Did I Jerry. 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 <laughs> I knew I had that wrong. Sorry. Jerry. Yeah, that's okay. I, I wrote it down even. Jerry Goldsmith um, that did the composing of all the other music. Um, now, the but score. He, 
he's obviously taking pieces of what you've created, right? Some of those themes that you not created. willingly. <laughs> yeah, tell us about that because I know Jerry comes in uh, and he he you know he was really well known. He's done so many. What was his nickname? We called him the Silver Lion. Is that what he was no, called? I, I had a I had yeah a yeah he Lion. had a yeah you had a different nickname probably. But go ahead. Um, well, the first day I, I met Jerry was uh, on the scoring stage uh, for the first time that they were going to score the film. <laughs> and again, you got to remember, I'm green. You know, I, I, I'm do, this, every, this is just a series of firsts for me. And his opening gambit was, nice to meet you. Too bad I'm not using any of your music in my score. <laughs> oh. and, I, and I was like, <laughs> I was like a sucker punch. And I just, you know, I'm just bug eyed again, you know, uh, didn't quite know what to say to that. And Montan, Chris Montan was standing right next to me and I just had this, smile painted on my face and I kind of looked over at Chris and I looked back at him and nice to meet you. But, <laughs> wow. um, first it was, meetings, it wasn't first impressions. Too, it wasn't too long after that, that, uh, they sort of read him the riot act and said, you know, this, th that dog won't hunt. You gotta, yeah. you, mm -hmm. you have to, you have to tip your hat to the, the song score. And that's when, you know, <laughs> miraculously the opening, uh gambit is honored to us all and he's you know talking he's he's making references to that mm -hmm. ah, you know you hear that at the at the yep. opening of the film and there were other things that along the way that they twisted his arm but it turned out i mean if if he wasn't into it he sure didn't show it in his rendering if that yes. makes sense that yeah. he he well i think that that uh Sweet for Mulan that he composed out of the melodies. I don't think it was ever in the movie. It may have played at the very end of the credits. Yeah. But it's just called Sweet for Mulan. Right. That's, that's a phenomenal uh, orchestration. orchestration. It's, yes. ama it's an amazing piece and beautiful. And I think that the action cue he wrote for the avalanche is one mm -hmm. of the greatest action cues I've ever heard in a movie. Mm -hmm. That is just one of the Absol most phenomenal action cues I've ever heard in any movie. I love it. I mean, he was such a giant. And I think yeah, uh, yeah. I, <laughs> I witnessed, I witnessed some things in, in meetings that were just, uh, I can't describe. It was the eye popping moments, you know, just the sheer blood curdling honesty that would come out of this man's mouth. And oh, I was yeah. like, wow. Was no, this kind that's, of the, the that's situation power. where never meet your, you know, your legends? Your idols. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, and every time he looked at me, I think he, it was as if he was looking at a Picasso. He couldn't make heads or tails of <laughs> why I'm walking this planet. <laughs> Maybe it was a hair. Is that his Maybe eye? Is that hair. His, yeah, the hair. I will say that I've talked about it on this podcast before, but I had a run in with Jerry Goldsmith too. Did that, you? Um, oh yeah. Where, and Barry was there too, but we've got stories. We've got stories, but I was, I have I could say that I'm one that will probably go down in history as saying I was chewed out. I was cursed out by Jerry Goldsmith. Every, oh, really? every word in the book thrown at me. And uh, yeah, it's kind of a red badge of courage that I think. I, I do remember wear. all of us sitting in a, in a meeting with him at one point. I can't remember who this was directed at, but I remember somebody had offered up some opinion and Jerry was turning, yeah. turning and saying, that's, that's one of the stupidest things I've ever heard in my life. And I was like, Oh my God, I was sitting right in front that, of him. That was probably the start of it. I don't know. I mean, yeah, my, my story has to do with the, the, the haircutting moment. And that was a big issue for Barry and I all along because we, we had a certain amount of, uh, we had a, cer a certain scratch track mm -hmm. in that sequence that was there from day one when it was storyboarded by Dean Dubois and we fell in love with it and it had a certain um, beat and rhythm to well, it. A rhythm. And, it and, yeah. and admittedly, it wasn't just you guys. Like we had rough screenings of that with the, sc the scratch track because as we all said, that reflection song and the haircutting after that, it was all very early boarded stuff that mm -hmm. the whole Florida studio had fallen in love with and that scratch track that went to the beat exactly well, yeah and it was the, it was Mars. the time of mtv really and when when music videos were cut as right. a visually to beats and stuff and rhythms and we had cut that sequence like a music video if you will at the time mm -hmm. and jerry didn't get the idea that we don't want you to score these shots we want you we need you to write something under it and in hindsight we probably should have just turned to matthew 
to write what needed to go yeah. under that song and th that never sort of came up but that would have been why, better because it's still a strange it's still a very strange spot musically in the film but i will say the day that if i could just tell the story really quick yeah they said okay if you want jerry to change this you and tony have to go over to his house saturday morning and talk to him about it and we've told this story before in different forums but uh, so we knocked on the door and a nice lady answered the door. We said, we're here to see Mr. Goldsmith. Oh, okay. Uh, go past the swimming pool to the little house out back and go upstairs and wait for him there. So we went up there and we sat down in two sort of nice, you know, comfortable chairs. And we saw Jerry's just sort of the way Matthew has set up there. We saw a little keyboard and maybe a little some recording equipment, you know, and stuff on one side. And, and we looked at each other and we looked at this little shelf between us and there stood an Oscar. Mm -hmm. for some movie right between us and we're here to tell him you know that we want it's probably jobs we were these young knows, turks whatever. you know to him he just saw us as these young idiot directors i'm sure and here we are he's like he tried to put on you know a good like all right guys hey i got you 15 know, minutes yeah we're down to the hour here i got a lot to do so let me Did just you guys play bring what your i got trunks? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah. think he thought we were there originally to clean his pool. Clean and it right. probably would have been more successful if we would have done that. <laughs> but I just but, no, but he did come around. It, it. it did. Yeah. It did. We, you know, he did find it our way after a while. And, you know, we, we had to stand up for the film. Uh, ultimately, that's what we're doing. Sure. Is, is not, it shouldn't be about what we want. It should be about yeah. what Mulan, that's the right. film, wants. And ultimately, that's where we live and die as directors, and as, as animators and composers, is that it's not about us. It should be about the work. I have to say, though, uh, in deference, that um, having scored film now, uh, as opposed to just writing songs, the toughest thing walking in, because the music is usually the last, it's the caboose in the yeah. process. And um, when you have directors that have fallen in love with the temp track, Oh, yeah. and, and the composer is put upon and in this particular instance that I'm thinking about the director had tempted in an Oscar winning <laughs> against his uh, his picture mm -hmm. yeah. and and said I want give me something like that but and different. it's it's so difficult to to yeah. loosen the grip of the director's mind that you has been living with this music that he's been cutting to and then the composer comes in and he's going, what am I supposed to do here? Uh, because not only have you chosen something that you've fallen in love with, you've chosen something that is iconic and, and you've yeah. set the bar in such a capacity that you're asking me to come up with something original that's just like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, that it is unfair. It's totally unfair. And I, and I admit it because, and I think we apologized several times to Jerry. That was the only time we ever had him listen to the temp track. He refused to uh, in the beginning, of course. Well, you um, killed him, Tony. I, oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, you, oh, is yeah, it did, too early still? Did, did we say he's the late uh, Jerry Goldsmith? Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Uh, well, that, that um, was dark, I'm wanna, sorry. I it got dark fast, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Matthew, you were gonna play a little bit of a song that got cut out. So you did some, uh, right. tell us about in general, just uh, how many songs that you wrote were, that were cut out, do you know? Uh, two to my recollection, and they were both from Mushu. Oh. I, don't th I think- uh, You I started a song for the beginning. Remember we had a different opening for the song and you guys took a whack at a song for the very that, opening? It was like I a dream. Yeah, I don't remember, but uh, I'm, I'm sure that's accurate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but there were you know, two or three moments that didn't make it to the, didn't make it to the film. Mm -hmm. And in this particular instance, um, we tried our hand to musicalize M M Mushu's character with a song called Keep Him Guessin'. Mm -hmm. And Billy Porter sang the demo, which was phenomenal. Wow. Man. And it was a great jazzy send up. And it was just one of the better songs that David and I had written. Mm -hmm. And Eddie Murphy would not have it. He wouldn't sing. So I had the idea to take... Um, Eddie Murphy's iconic moment where he plays James Brown on Saturday Night Live, yeah. and let's <laughs> let's do a comedic thing that where he can talk his way yeah, through talk sing, um, yeah. talk sing, 
and and let's try that and wow. uh and that's the moment that i think uh we're talking about let me, yeah let me look in the computer. play a little bit of that keep it guessing yeah, keep, keep them guessing party. by mushu and this <laughs> this actually would have hit um in the story after mulan um right after she meets mulan uh, mushu for the very first time and before she goes into the camp, camp the, yeah. mm -hmm. the army camp. i left the lap of luxury to help you with your plight wow this is where you live? Now, sweetheart, would I lie to you? Twas just an average night. And that's Matthew singing. Would you get that? The great stone dragon begged me to attend some family do. Please come off the carpet. <laughs> A meeting of your ancestors on how to deal with you. Great Mushu, stop your partying and be our family guardian. Trust me, babe, you are the one with all the power. Trust me, babe, big guy, there's nothing you can't do. I love it. You come through complete with service in one hour. He delivers while you wait a miracle or two. Gospel going on there. Yeah, that almost sounded a little Hercules so, there. Yeah. yeah, there is that in Hercules for sure. Now, I would, do want to say that was fully storyboarded, if I remember right. No, no, not this version. This is So this is oh, the first is one the that he one. just played. Okay. Keep Him Guessing, which you can actually see on YouTube, was completely That's storyboarded. Right. That's the more uh, talk sung version. Right. Well, actually, Ed, this Ed is, I think, uh, well, I'm going to have to go look to, to, to square this. But mm -hmm. I think this is the one that you, may, you were saying before we went live that you storyboarded. Um, Keep Him yeah. Guessing is, is, is a jazzy sung, th sung through, but the, the verses in this one are, are sort of spoken. So if, if, if that's what you're referring to, then that's mm -hmm. what you storyboarded. Mm -hmm. Well, and, yeah. and let's, we'll, we'll let Tony be wrong. But anyway, we, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, but I, I, I don't, don't think you are, but, but I, don't I, remember. Look up to, I looked up to Matthew, so I won't correct yeah. him. So, but <laughs> is this just for Barry maybe, uh, once this got cut out, because that hot tub thing, he was being James Brown. Oh, get yeah, right. Yeah, get out of the hot tub, right? And yeah. so this was going to have some of that. Yeah. Um, is is what came out of this once this got cut out? Remember, we have that whole thing where he's the shadow, and I'm the indestructible. Yeah, the preacher. Yeah, kind yeah, of the yeah, Southern yeah, Baptist preacher. preacher. Was sort of the the what came out of that. Yeah, because we still wanted something that had. The, oh, sorry. Go on. This is to Barry. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, yeah. no, but it, yeah, it was. Uh, we wanted just sort of a big intro. We wanted to. Yeah. Sort of, and and his character, he needed to make a big first impression. So I think that's was sort of came out of what we needed his character to be at that moment. How could he possibly convince? Mulan to take him along for the ride unless he yeah. sort of made a big a big show of his first appearance yeah well and and i love that there's this thing that i i think even today some people don't catch up on with mushu which is he still in his head thinks he's this great big stone dragon and that he's been demoted this played that up with the shadow i'm still this i'm still this then he walks out and he's this tiny little mushu and he gets stepped yeah. on yeah. I, know, I, love that song. And I thought I thought Eddie Murphy uh, and Mushu, a musical moment would have been a uh, a showstopper. Uh, it, yeah. it was. Really, I, yeah. I personally like the idea too, but before we could even say anything, <laughs> it was. I remember it was Tom Schumacher that said, "That will never be played again." <laughs> that's right. I, I, that's the words I, I remember him saying. I remember him <laughs> saying, "I will never have anything like that in my movie ever." <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I was standing there. Boo! <laughs> I, I mean, I enjoyed it. It just took, I the, just it took the air was, out of the room. It was an oh, incredible yeah. moment. It was one and then of those. he stormed out. Yeah. He, he, he says, I will never have anything like that in my movie and walked out of the room. And I was just like, what just happened? I know. again, I, firsts, you know. Well, and it was one of those moments where it's like Barry and I are like, well, I guess it doesn't matter what the directors think about it. But, <laughs> but I mean, I think it was, one, it was definitely one of those things. I think we played it actually. Barry, I think that's why we storyboarded one of the versions is because didn't it, I think it actually played in one of the, the screenings for the crew. A, yeah, I sure. think there was a screen. Yeah, and, and it was an overriding note that we got. It was, it was kind of like, um, it, it was the, the thing we kept coming back to is it just felt like the, the movie was like throwing it up, just pushing it away. It just wasn't, wasn't to be part of the It film. could have been where it was too, because when we first see him as an audience, when he first comes to life, 
when he says, I live, you know, this sort of first shot, right? That <laughs> yeah. might have been a better place for a song for him than later yeah. in the in the thick uh, of those. Oh, songs, oh now you, know? you come up with that brilliant idea. Yeah. <laughs> it takes a while sometimes. So can, but Tom, you wouldn't have done back. such a brilliant job at animating that shot where he yeah, rises no, up out of the grave. We could have done the same visuals. Look at the head. The yeah. song could have been called I Live. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have it for you by tomorrow. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. This is, co this is going somewhere. I kind of like I, it. I feel we, like you know, we're going to do like us. a director's edition, right? I'll animate Well, you do you get an insight. Right? No, but it's cool because you do get an insight about how ideas start and how that's how it all starts. You know, you just sort of get a notion and one person throws something in and one person throws something in and one person is excited about it and one person says it's dumb and one person fights for their idea and that's, you know, that's cool. It, yeah. it would have been funny to hear that song all sung in his kind of Igor kind of a, uh, you know, voice that he was using too. Uh, God, that would have been horrible. Over. That's yeah. a horrible idea, Tom. Not. Oh, great. <laughs> so Barry's got all genius and I throw out a good idea. And, oh, I don't know. That's just how it works that, this time around. Anyway, um, we got to start wrapping this up, but I will say um, any last thoughts about the live action Mulan that you guys want to share with this audience? A lot of people ask us. I'm sure a lot of people have asked you guys, but Tom and I get it all the time. What do you think of these Disney remakes? Um, how does Mulan stack up as a Disney remake? I loved the fact that it wasn't a shot for shot remake. I yeah, love right. that about this film. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I think the film's great. And uh, as a director of the original film, I say, go see it. It's great. It's a great film. That's awesome. Yeah, I feel pretty much the same way. It's it's it stands on its own merit, and it's yeah. it's a beautiful film. And Ife is a yeah. light. The mm -hmm. the actress that plays Mulan, it, you can't take your eyes off her, and neither yeah. can the camera because it's on her like yeah. this for most of the movie. It's yeah. phenomenal. She really so, does make the the film, doesn't she? Yeah, and, I think and, so. And I, I think the artistry um, and strong narrative storytelling that Nikki Caro up late in there um mm -hmm. it's just amazing uh so yeah I, I think we got three thumbs up tom you can't vote because you haven't seen it so i can't but we'll loser. come back to you loser yeah yeah let's do a whole nother podcast where it's just me talking uh, <laughs> i mean you guys are just there you go. that sounds dream that sounds dream every podcast uh, is like why perfect. don't you let me talk more <laughs> i know I stepped on you twice on this one. Because you come up with these brilliant ideas, I guess, about Mushu singing as Igor. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> I, okay. Anyway. Hey, to, uh, this let's, has been last, fantastic, let's, guys. This has been fun. Um, and I really am so thankful that you guys could give us all this time. And, and, and especially for those that are listening on the podcast, but all those that are there at Walt Disney Family Museum, um, mm -hmm. we're so thankful Walt Disney has meant a lot to all of us. I want to end on this quick little questions and get all your quick reactions, okay? I think Walt Disney films, animated films, has meant so much to us in our, in our youth and our growing up and to the artists that we've become. Mm -hmm. Real quick, all the way around, I want to hear from everybody. What's the most impactful Disney film um, that you remember seeing? It doesn't have to be the first one, but what's, what's your favorite Disney animated film, Matthew? Don't say Mulan. Uh, probably Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Wow, going all the way back. Yeah, old school. Barry. Old school. Well, look Barry at doesn't me. watch animated films. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Peter Pan from the Disney collection. That's I love one of that my too. All time's yeah. favorites. Yeah. And Tony, I'm going to grab 101 Dalmatians before you do. It's such uh, a good story. It's funny. It's it's got an amazing art style. It's kind of the whole package. I'm very charmed actually by, I wasn't going to say that one, Tom. I was going to say okay. Lady and the Tramp. I'm yeah, very charmed by that Lady story. I love like the character animation. Mm -hmm. we're, we're dog guys, I guess. I well, guess. it's interesting because every, you know, when you're mentioning those films, I'm going, oh, I should have said that one. Oh, I should have said that one. <laughs> but you one. did, so, Matthew. But I That's... didn't. I went for, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I went for and, the class. Matthew, I don't, we can't end this yet. I just want to hear, what are you up to now? I want everybody to hear, what, what's, uh, what is Matthew? Nice. Uh, oh gosh, I'm uh, on the spot here. Um, let's see. I just did, I just scored a, a feature length uh, animation for uh, a Japanese director called True North. It's an adult subject uh, about North Korea. Mm. It's an adult driven animation. It's doing all the all the uh, festivals now, and uh, I'm helping a young artist. Uh, we're releasing her first single August 31st. Her name is Oscar O. Keep mm. a lookout for that. 
Wow. And um, let's see. And I'm working on a musical. Uh, if the West End ever opens up again, um, we'll see. I can't really talk about it right now, but but um, that's what's. And, and and I know because I follow you faithfully on Facebook that you scored a an animated short or feature? yes, that's, short. that's right, a short uh, called the the Pig on the Hill. Uh, yeah, it's based on a oh. on a beautiful little children's uh, book from out of England, and that's up online. You guys can go see that. It's on the cartoon network i think um yeah, and it's i've on seen YouTube. it it's very charming it's really and again uh it's my uh adventures in uh getting deeper into film scoring it's it's been a blast oh. a lot of, it's much different so it sounds like here. if tony and i made a, a little animated short it wouldn't be out of the picture to ask you me. You know my name. <laughs> Look up my number. All right, That's Barry, right. You're, you're up next. What are you up to right now? Well, I just got back from Nashville a couple of weeks ago, and I was what? born and raised up there. But uh, I, because of COVID, I didn't knock on anybody's door, That's but uh, except my brothers. But uh, mm -hmm. um, I wrote a script uh, this year. Well, my my father passed away a year and a half ago, and I mm -hmm. after that I sort of wrote this cathartic script. It's a ghost story, mm -hmm. and. If you know anything about my work, the very first film I made when I was 10 years old was a retelling of Dickens' Christmas Carol with four ghosts. But, and the last film I didn't make at Disney had a title at one time of A Few Good Ghosts. And I, and I developed even another ghost story, but this is a ghost story sort of meant for a live, a live action short film. But uh, I have my cousin who's an actor and does a lot of country music videos up in Nashville um, he's helping me with it. We're turning it into an audio drama. We turned oh. the script into an audio drama. We want to oh. make it as a, uh, I don't know, find a release for a podcast or something, but it's a really yeah. cool story. And it's sort of a, it's not a horror movie. It's not, it's a sort of a fun ghost story and it's uh, a little dark in places, but it's really fun. So, oh, that's a great that's idea. A, Those are so popular right now too. Yeah. Uh, and I thought it'd be a great way to sort of explore the material, mm -hmm. explore the script, make it better you know, yeah. sort of workshop it in an audio version. So it's That's really awesome. different for me because I'm used to always working with visuals. Visually, but, right. Yeah, yeah, but to try to do it audibly is sort of a fun exercise. Hmm. Well, if you need a score for it, I know where you could go. <laughs> <laughs> it's called The Happy Place. Uh, <laughs> That's what we call Matthew. Call yeah. my agent, Tom Bancroft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he works really cheap, so. <laughs> yeah, no yeah. yeah, you don't want Tom. As you agent. have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's why we're both broke. <laughs> no. Well, guys, this has been amazing. We really have to wrap up now, uh, but I, I'm so glad we did this. Everyone, please go check out the new uh, live action Mulan on Disney Plus. And uh, I know it's uh, three out of four stars. I don't count though. So no. uh, yeah, it's actually three out of three stars. Yeah. So everybody go see that. And thank you guys um, uh, for coming. It's just great reminiscing with you. Tony, as we always say, anime, anime from the heart. heart.